Hey everybody, thanks for coming. Uh, I'm Jared Waxman, head of growth for a small business group here at Yahoo, and today we are really honored to have Sean Ellis uh, come and, and give a little, a, a little talk. Uh, he's up in San Francisco for the day, uh, and uh, I asked him if he could share some secrets with us, and of course there's no secrets, but I'll share the, uh, uh, share the truth. Um, so, you know, as you guys probably know, Sean uh, wrote a post in 2010, which kind of lit a fire around this, this term growth hacking. Uh, and now, you know, if you look, startups are always hiring a growth hacker. Large companies even are are, are, are spinning up groups uh, called growth or growth hacking or whatever you know the, the variation on the term is. Uh, uh, Sean has worked for Zavni, which is now part of Yahoo, as well as uh, he worked with a lot of other companies, Eventbrite, Crook Street, and and Login, and um, all these companies up here, <laughs> um, Dropbox. So uh, I'm gonna kick it off, let you um, uh, give your presentation, and then we'll come back in a few minutes and do a little, uh, a little Q&A, a little interview, so uh, come up with some questions along the way. Sounds good. All right, thanks, John. Right. Thanks, Jim. Hey, guys. Um, so I will, uh, it's kind of debating sit or stand. It's a <laughs> small enough group here, but I'll stand up. Um, so it's just a few things I'll go through, just a little bit on what my background is, and then uh, and then to talk a little bit about just the process that I use and, and um, the uh, really kind of the stages of growth and then the process that it used to, to scale growth and then well just a discussion among ourselves and uh, Jared sent me a few questions ahead of time so um, we'll keep it pretty flexible and try to try to dive into whatever makes the most sense so um, covered pretty much the, the early career I'll put a little more context on it that my uh, my I spent um, ten years across two companies where I was in the you know, customer zero through um, IPOs with a couple of companies, and so was able to see the the span of uh, you know what it what it took in the beginning and ultimately to, to get a company to a point where you know not the Yahoo size, but to, to get a company to a point where it um, was big enough to be sustainable in the public markets. And um, what I learned during that time was that uh, most of my value at personally was in the upfront part. That you know when we figured out. Who really needed the product? Why they needed it? How we could how we could really tailor the product and positioning and onboarding all those things for the right group of people and, and build the customer acquisition systems around that. Um, once we had all of those things figured out, a lot of it went was just sort of executing on that and, and maybe discovering a few more channels. But uh, but most of the value add was upfront, and I also realized that um, in ten years across those two companies, then the majority of my time was not in that upfront important stage, and so I wanted to get cycles with lots of companies. So that's where I, um, it's kind of hard in startups because you usually, a big part of your compensation is obviously um, equity and it vests over four years. And so if it works, then you're kind of incented to, to stick around. So nobody really was getting the, the cycles up front. So just to be able to negotiate six month uh, roles with companies gave me an opportunity to, to, to do that a few more times. and. What I'll show you is is more of the framework that I started to see emerging out of out of those opportunities of, of really maybe it, it may not seem as relevant here, but I but I've actually gone back and and taken a couple of companies that were um, more mature and done some of the things that were really important for foundational growth in those later stage companies and found that they really made a big difference in accelerating growth. So hopefully, hopefully they uh, can't promise silver bullets, but hopefully there's. Um, there's some, some lessons in there that will still be relevant. Um, and then now I'm the, the founder and CEO of Growth Hackers, which is uh, essentially a company that I originally raised money for a few years ago and that through different twists and turns have arrived where, where I am now and we might go into some of the detail um, in, our, in our discussion about that. Um, but I think as I go through this, it'll give a little bit more context to why. So this, my, my slides here are about 20 minutes and then the majority of them will be more Q&A discussion, so get through pretty quickly. So um, as I said, uh, I in, in going to companies uh, trying to trying to get that, that upfront stage figured out, what I what I ultimately ended up coming up with was a framework of your know, product market fit um, is is probably the biggest factor in, in long term growth. The right product in the right market is is gonna you know provide more impact on growth than any individual tactic or anything else that you come up with. Um, and so getting product market fit, and then there's a, a stage that I went through, which uh, I call the stacking the odds stage, and I'll, I'll provide a little context on what that is, and then the you know, majority of companies who get through those spend most of their time then scaling growth, and uh, I'll 
spent a lot of time talking about scaling growth because I think it's the most relevant to uh, what you guys are probably doing on a daily basis. But a um, couple of things on product market fit. So as I said, I think this is the most important factor in, in a company's ability to drive growth. And so particularly as I, um, as I was picking interim VP marketing roles, um, it, you know, half the battle was picking the right opportunities. Um, and I think as you as you launch products internally and other things, um, the right product in the right market, and even tweaking products and tweaking markets can, can make a huge difference for growth. Um, obviously, the best markets are large addressable markets, and your products are cost have for those markets. That's that's really, as I think of product market fit, what it is. Um, and I, I found a way to measure it pretty easily, which was I just asked users on a product, um, who would actually use the product, how they would feel that they couldn't use it anymore. And what I found is uh, when I gave them the choices, very disappointed, somewhat disappointed, not disappointed, or I don't use it anymore. Um, companies that had 40% or more of their users saying that they'd be very disappointed without the product, generally were, were pretty growable companies. And companies that um, the numbers were much lower were really hard to grow, and so it, it was a focusing exercise that um, if they weren't at that 40% number, then a lot of what we were doing was was trying to find the right market or tweak the product to get, get that right. Um, once they hit that 40%, uh, that that was a signal that we could more aggressively scale. So I know like Alex Schultz talks about uh, product market fit being really a retention cohort, and when and essentially anything that kind of long term, when that when retention flattens out, that that group of people who stay retained long term, it's kind of the same thing, just in a quantitative way. This is more of a qualitative question. The people who say they'd be very disappointed without the product are likely the same people who keep using it. So Alex Schultz, the guy who runs growth at uh, at Facebook, so you guys probably know who that is, but just in case you don't. Um, so. Uh, so basically the foundation of product market fit was critical. Stacking the odds was what I did with most companies in this interim role. And so like that's, the, you know, if there's any kind of silver bullet, it was really what I, what I did in the stacking the odds phase, which is, um, which is basically understanding, uh, you know, those users who say they can't live without the product, um, what, what is it about those users that makes the product the most have? So who are they? Uh, what, what, what is their, their profile? Um, why is it a must-have for those users? What is what is the benefit that they're getting from it? And um, you know, ultimately, how are they using the product? The more I can learn about those users, the more I can go out and create more users like them. And so that's what really the value, uh, optimizing the value delivery engine is about doing that. It's about knowing that if I get the right user to the right experience, they're likely gonna also consider the product a must-have. And so uh, often, Part of that is to create momentum with a really powerful, relevant promise about what the product will do for them. And if that's kind of bookended by the must-have experience of the product, then they're gonna come in with the right expectations, come in with a lot of momentum, and then a lot of the, um, a lot of the optimization and experimentation in that case is, is around um, reducing friction to get them to that must-have experience. So set the right promise, a lot of, a lot of just friction reduction and, and knowing that the, you know, the more of the right people that I can get into that core experience, that unlocks a lot of growth. And so for, for the majority of companies that I worked with in those interim roles, that, that defined a big part of that six months. It was not a lot of, uh, a lot of um, scaling. So on the, on the pyramid, the, the scaling growth period um, was, it, it was ultimately going to be a lot more effective if you've done those other things well. And so I was trying to cycle through and do those other things. But what I've been doing for the last really year to two years is just a deep dive on, on everything that it takes. Like, just what are the best practices across companies on being able to scale growth? And obviously, I've paid a lot of attention to it before. I have a lot of experience from it, with it before. But in the last couple of years, I've been really just studying how, how companies have, uh, approach the, the growth scaling and the experimentation and whether you call it growth hacking or marketing or the, the stuff the growth team does, um, that, that's ultimately, uh, I think, critical when it comes to scaling growth and that's, that's you know, what I'll we'll cover in these additional slides. So basically it boils down to um, a growth team and a growth process are, are what matters in scaling growth. and so. Um, the impact of growth teams in Silicon Valley has obviously been pretty, pretty
pretty high if you look at you know, most of these companies have kind of emerged in the last 10 years to, the, to be these really uh, valuable companies that uh, you don't see a lot of advertising around these companies like, like a lot of you know, Yahoo and everybody else was doing back, back in the 90s. Most of these companies kind of did something differently to get on the map and become really big and really valuable without a, a more of a traditional advertising approach. And, um, and interestingly, I kind of put the arrows there that you can track, you can track most growth teams, most effective growth teams back to Facebook and LinkedIn. Um, and, and actually those two companies, um, the original growth team uh, people came out of eBay. So I think it's more the process side came out of eBay and then um, really organizing a team around that was something that, uh, like Facebook has probably nailed it more than anybody and the, the, the poster child of who to, who to understand and do things, uh, who, who does things really well. And, and as, you, as you look at most of these other companies have been affected then by, by Facebook um, in terms of people who left Facebook and went, went to those companies. So, and, you can see just on this graph that's about when the face when the growth team at Facebook kind of kicked in, and that they've been able to sustain a lot of growth. But but interestingly, I think it's not just about a growth team because at um, at Twitter they introduced a growth team in 2009, and um, and in 2010 the growth actually started to slow down quite a bit. And um, at that time they were doing one to two tests per month. And that was something that uh, the head of product that said in the presentation uh, a while ago that was recorded, uh, Satya Patel. And, um, and in 2011, they accelerated their testing from that one to two a month to 10 plus a month. And when you actually look at their, their growth rate, you can see that just, just around that time, that, that just that higher velocity of testing seemed to really make a difference for them. And I think, and it makes sense because you don't know what's going to work and what's not going to work, and that, um, and that each test you run is going to help you understand more about how, how you're going to grow a business. And if you run two per month, one or two per month, you're not going to be really effective with it. If you run 10 per month, you're going to be more effective. Um, I, uh, I kind of took that to heart myself. We, as we were growing uh, Growth Hackers, we, growthhackers.com, we did pretty well in the first year, and um, it's, it's more targeted group of, of mostly growth marketers and engineers, and um, we we did pretty well. Got it to about ninety thousand monthly active users, and then flattened out after the first year. And so for three straight months, we were flat. While I was, I also have Paul Ruse, another business that we've that we've got folded in the company. And so I just was busy with a lot of things and not focused on growth. And I just kept telling the team, you know, we need to run more experiments. But I did. I wasn't real specific around it. And when I finally said. Um, and probably more came out of Jason. Jason uh, runs our product. He flew up with me today. Um, but Jason was talking about, you know, we, we need to run more experiments as well. And so we just, by setting the goal and saying, let's, let's run at least three experiments every week. They can be tiny experiments or big experiments or whatever we can do. Let's set that target. That's kind of the leading indicator of growth. By the time you're not hitting growth targets or hitting growth targets, let's that's the lagging indicator if you if you did the right stuff, but the, but the testing seemed to be more predictive of that. And so you can see what happened to the growth curve once we once we started to run those tests on a weekly basis. And there was no additional people on the team, no additional spending. That was just literally running more tests. I'll kind of talk about where those tests are in a second, but uh, um, sorry. So Running tests like that needs needs a process. Um, otherwise, it gets it can get out of control. And so, most good growth teams have a have a process that looks something like this. I'm sure you guys have something that looks like this, and um, and pretty much everybody has something that looks like this. But basically, collect a whole bunch of ideas of things you can do, uh, prioritize those ideas, and um, and then test those ideas, and then uh, and then capture the learning. And as you do, as you repeat that, you learn more and more about how, how to grow the business and, um, and, it, and it just works better. So um, unbridled ideation, the first part on there, um, what we found is that that works best if you're getting ideas, not just from the growth team, but literally from across the company. So um, people in support can, can get really good ideas that tend to be pretty empathetic around needs and some onboarding things that might be confusing for, for users. Um, the engineering team tends to be able to give ideas that are more 
uh, around uh, what's possible. And so we have some really neat ideas that have come out of our engineering team that I, I know I would have never uh, thought of. And we're really looking across really all vectors of growth. So uh, like Dave McClure from 500 Startups talks about the, uh, the R framework. So it's everything from acquisition ideas, so things that are out in the channel to activation and retention, revenue, referral, and improvement in any one of those areas is gonna lift your overall growth rate. And so collecting lots of ideas in those areas um, gives, gives is, is ultimately the fuel for growth. If you don't have ideas, you're not gonna be able to grow. So we also gamify it and you know keep track of who's coming up with the most ideas. It's a quantity rather than quality. We'll figure out the quality in the prioritization, but um, quantity is, you need that to start with. And so for prioritizing the backlog, um, of ideas, that's where we organize in an experiment doc, and just about every growth team has something, some kind of experiment doc. Um, we like to include things like research in ours, um, hypothesis, what what are we specifically trying to achieve with, with this idea, um, where is the idea focused, uh, we also like to, to tag it up so that we're looking at things like is, it, is the idea not just within acquisition, but is it using Twitter, is it using, you know, ads is it you know wherever it might be but but being able to then group some of these things together when we decide that um, you know, particularly as you start to see more wins in an area you want to find related ideas and learn more of those ideas so being able to just essentially bring context to the idea helps to bring it to life um, and we also score each idea based on what we call an ice score so um, if it's successful, what will the impact be? That's the I in ICE. The, um, is how confident are we? Do we have a lot of evidence that, that shows that this will be um, the likely to be successful? And then what's the, uh, how easy is it to test this idea? And so what we're looking for is ideas that are, are likely to be very high impact if they're successful and really easy to test. And, um, and you know, the more that we have to choose from, the more likely we're gonna be find ones, find ones that fit that. And then high tempo testing is really about setting that target, that aggressive target, and um, figuring out the bottlenecks that prevent you from hitting that aggressive target. And so um, sometimes for us, the bottlenecks will be, you know, we don't have a, a dedicated product manager to get that project, across, or that idea across the finish line to test it. Sometimes that project manager won't have access to some development resources or the, some design resources or whatever it might be or that the um, tracking was never set up properly so we can't launch it until we get the right tracking in place but but essentially the more that we can figure out what the bottlenecks are week to week that are slowing down our testing velocity the more likely we can address those things and then start to move that goal from three per week to four per week to five per week and then finally capturing learning. So um, as you run a higher velocity of tests, it's really easy to start running repeat tests. And so making sure that you don't do that becomes pretty pretty important. And so you wanna be able to really catalog the tests that you've run and, um, and group the winners together and, uh, and start to, to really analyze which types of tests are winning. Are, are they the retention tests? Are they uh, the Twitter tests? Are they where, wherever they might, uh, any signal that you can get around that is gonna give you more uh, relevant ideas. So for example, our top idea contributor is actually our analyst. You know, a lot of people talk about left brain, right brain. Your analyst is the person who you wouldn't expect to come up with many ideas, but he's, he's the guy who's basically seeing what's working and what's not working first. And as he's going through, he's thinking, oh, well, I probably would have run it this way, or um, maybe, you know, based on that learning, let's do this double down idea. And, and all, all of those things can help to lead to better ideas, um, but it, it, it requires that you actually capture the learning and not haphazard around it. Um, so again, that's, that's the process. Um, and just one last slide here, and then we can, um, Basically, you know, I think the, the ultimate goal, I think what makes companies like Dropbox and, and Facebook really effective is that they do have a culture of growth, you know, across, across the board. And interestingly, with Dropbox, after I left, it was almost a year before another person in the marketing or growth team was added to the business. So they didn't have anyone in marketing or growth for almost a year, yet their experimentation velocity continued to go, grow go and they had uh, you know the steepest growth trajectory of any company that I've worked on and I could see new more and new things added to um, to the, the product that were, were growth related projects uh, 
Facebook is famous for essentially anybody being able to run experiments for a period of time. Um, I think they've gotten more organized over time, but there's, there's definitely a culture, like in the case of Facebook, that came from Mark Zuckerberg down that's, that's, uh, has, has created, you know, move fast and break things is, is um, okay if you're willing to, to experiment in, in the name of trying to achieve a better result. So um, it takes patience to, to get other people on board. It's not, it's not something that you, I think you can snap your fingers and, and people falling behind growth, but, uh, but as you do it, as you get the wins, as you're transparent about the losses as well, but just realizing that you know, some, of the best, some of the best experiments that we've run, we, we ran one experiment for Qualaroo where we made the free version really much more effective with the hypothesis that that would, that would accelerate growth and, um, and it didn't at all. It, it tanked our, our numbers, tanked our revenue numbers because we, we, we didn't get any of the anticipated word of mouth around a really good free product, but we got all the people who chose the free product instead of the paid product. And, um, and, but we learned from that that there was a lot less price sensitivity around the product than we expected there to be. And so we 5 x the price and that I mean, there was almost no reduction in demand when we 5 x the price. So like in, in each of those experiments, you do learn something. Um, but basically, I think as you create that growth culture, it means that across the company, everybody has an eye for growth opportunities. And as people have an eye for growth opportunities, you get more and more into the ideas backlog for us right now, we have over 400 ideas in our ideas backlog and in our weekly growth meeting, when we can pick from those, it means it's really easy to find three that we can get excited to, to run each week. So that's it. Um, I know that you uh, had some uh, things you want to go through. and Sure, so, well, maybe yeah. we'll pull up some chairs and ask some, ask some, I'll ask you some questions and then maybe everyone else can ask some questions. Perfect. Thanks, it was really great, Sean. Um, in particular, I really, I really like the, the focus on that one question, you know, how, uh, how painful would it be if, if you couldn't use this product anymore? Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of people talk about, you know, businesses that, that keep improving generally have like one metric that really helps everybody get on the same page. And I think, I think that's, that's a really, you know, great lens uh, to, to look at. I'm, I'm hoping we can we can borrow from some of that. Yeah. Um, well, that's great. Uh, before we get into some of the, 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 the questions just around growth, I, I just want to you know back up a little bit on your background and, and actually you know kind of what you're doing, you know your day job today, um, and kind of let everybody kind of understand what that's all about. So so right now you're the CEO of Qualaroo and also GrowthHackers.com. Right. Uh, so tell you know tell us a little bit about about those businesses and. And why they're together, and, 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 and why you chose to work on and probably a lot of opportunities. Why you chose to work on those two opportunities? Right. So, so as I talked about the your product market fit is the the number one determinant on being able to grow a business. And if uh, you know that that there, I think there's some some benefit to you know sometimes saying this is good enough and just hitting the accelerator, and doing the most that you can with with a business, but. Um, I, I think I, I'm, I'm pretty good with growth once I have the right product in my hand, but for the wrong product, I'm not any better than anyone else. And so, so a lot of what we've been trying to do over time is, is get the right product that we can scale. And so um, the original business that I founded was, was completely different. It wasn't quality or growth hackers, but I got enough into it where, where I realized that, that it just, the assumptions behind that business were, were not gonna work. And so, you know, Knowing when to hold them and when to fold them yeah. was was part of it. And I had raised enough money. At that time, we raised five and a half million dollars. I went and acquired um, what is now Qualaroo. Um, it was a project of Kiss Insights. And what I found is, as we've been uh, executing on on Qualaroo, is that um, it's a it's a survey product. Actually, Yahoo's yeah, a customer on there. Cool. Um, and it's as you're navigating a website, um, it's tied in with the analytics so that if you go to Abandon a page, for example, it'll say, you know, what were you looking for that you decided not to stay, or um, you decided not to purchase today, why not? Like, um, or what are you trying to do today? Like, it kind of gives you intent or or those other kinds of issues. But I think the market's relatively relatively small for that product, and like 
people have a set of ideas when they go in to use it of questions they want to ask, and then and then uh, they stop using the product. And so, um, you know, for us, it's been you know, Growth Hackers is really really kind of looking at Qualaroo and um, Growth Hackers. I'll go into it for a second of how how Growth Hackers emerge, but um, we just see a lot more potential around Growth Hackers and the workflow. So Growth, growth Hackers itself is a community, but also Canvas is this workflow piece that gets into it where um, there's ultimately managing the process, some of the screenshots I had in there, managing the process of growth and having a community of 150,000 growth professionals. Um, there's, there's something that we're working toward there that, that ultimately will be more transactional, um, plus plus SaaS, plus there's 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 a few things there that you know kind of learn from each thing and that where Qualaroo has a relatively high churn rate for the reasons that I said, if you're building a growth process around a system, you you're gonna keep using that over time. And so that's that's really what we're working towards with the Growth Hackers product. Um, but Growth Hackers itself, the community emerged as a tactic that we did initially for Qualaroo, oh. where we <clears throat> For marketing related products, the um, content marketing tends to be the most effective uh, way to grow those businesses. And if you guys do much content marketing, it's kind of a pain in the ass. And so I, I just watched companies that were real effective with content marketing, the amount of, um, they, they essentially become content businesses, that they, they have to hire and write, they have to hire a lot of people or, or contract with a lot of people to write a lot of content and it's a quantity and quality balance that just seemed like something I didn't want to get into. So um, I thought, you know, there's so much great content, there's almost a glut of great content out there, so I'd rather aggregate that content together, build some community around other people's content, do some curation, and there was, ultimately, I thought that there was a lack of community as well for growth professionals in right. way. And so I saw enough voids there that that's what we ended up coming out with, growth hackers and, um, and got traction a little deeper yeah. than we thought and we just yeah. you know, worked out from there. That's fascinating. So it sounds like you raised uh, five and a half million dollars per company and your sort of mission was to help uh, other companies find that product market fit so that they can then really you know scale or grow. And the Qualaroo product was a sort of a survey, pro it was a survey product that that's one piece of the puzzle but then as you started to try to market that business with content marketing that piece became its own success uh, and sort of even more the center of the, the business. Yeah, it shows how confusing that yeah. story that I just told was. <laughs> <laughs> to hear it's, it's all back. So, so yeah, the first was something called Catch Free that uh -huh. was um, was literally a completely different business. Oh, completely. And, uh, and for a number of reasons, it, it, the assumptions behind that business that were needed, like, again, like recurring usage habitually use it was as app discovery for premium apps and services and it turned out the people who came back only came back once every three months and we also plan to market it through AdWords which is something that I've done with with other companies AdWords and, and Yahoo and you know where, wherever we could do kind of intent harvesting into these free services and um, but we we got cut out of those channels because we were sort of uh, and information, you know, not adding a whole lot of additional information in there. And so for, for a number of reasons, that's a, that's a long story in my heart. Okay. <laughs> but, but so, yeah, so we had money and not an idea. And so it's like a, a cold start into Qualaroo. And then Qualaroo has, has essentially built up to the point where it's very, you know, cash flow positive and has, has essentially provided, um, I think it was somebody, was it? No, it was, uh, but it, it, it uh, it, it's essentially provided enough cash for us to build the business that we're building now in a way that you know a lot of it is we need to be um, we need to be patient with the business that we're building it, it, there's there's a fairly complex system around um, having a SaaS and a community work together in a way that's that's viable and so um, that's like our, our waiting list for canvas is about 1100 companies and like every company <coughs> think of is on that waiting list, but we just, um, we've been pretty slow about bringing them in because we've got such a good flow of feedback right now that um, 
that we we know there's a lot of competition. If you don't have the right process in place, you're not you're not very likely to stick on the system. So we're, we're essentially finding people who have the right process in place, bringing them into the system, iterating on feedback, and and working toward where we think ultimately would be a really interesting market there. But that patient approach is is possible because we have good cash flow coming off the wall. Well, this is what's so, I think, great about talking to you and hearing your experiences because you don't just go out there and, and preach and lecture about product market fit and experimentation. You're, you're doing that with your business, right? At the same time, you're, you're trying to find, you know, you're probably asking that question, you know, how, how, you know, how painful would it be if, if this product doesn't exist yeah. for you? And you're trying to figure out what, um, what about that experience makes people successful and get them there more quickly. Yeah. And then once you've really cracked a nut on that, then you're gonna open it up to the other other yeah, yeah. And, and part of the challenge, I mean, so we have a board meeting this afternoon, and part of the challenge, like going into the board meeting today, is you know, I after I go through everything, I'm gonna be asking the board of directors, do you think we're being too conservative? You have to pick one or the other. Are we being too conservative or too yeah. too aggressive? And you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna lay out the facts as clearly as possible because my my gut says we're being exactly right, and that's why <laughs> that's why we're that's why we're taking the approach that we are. I'm, I'm, honing in on what I think is the right approach there. But um, I think, again, without product market fit, like the, there's been s studies, um, I can't remember the group that did, that did a, looked at a lot of failed companies and premature premature scaling of those businesses was the, was the number one thing that kills companies. So what you can see is that we've, we've now raised 7.2 million combined, but until I had the right formula, I've been super conservative about about the cash in the business because I, you know, ultimately know that in the situation of good product market fit, we built something great. But until we get there, I have to I have to keep the uh, the, the burn pretty low. So. so let's let's go back and talk just about the term because when I sometimes when I say uh, growth hacking to people, either they look at me funny or they have kind of a fuzzy idea of what it is. You know, you touched on it a little bit, but let's talk about that. What led you specifically to come up with that term? At the time, yep. and then kind of how how was you thinking about it evolved since? So, uh, probably the biggest thing at that time that, that uh, led me to come up with it was the the misinformation, the misperception from a lot of uh, startup CEOs who were asking for my help, but they would say, "We really need someone to come in and help us build awareness." It's like, really? You have how much money? How much time? Like. You're not going to build awareness. You need to acquire customers. You need to iterate on feedback. You need to, you need to figure out a sustainable growth engine. And it was, you know, for them, they had a, a preconception of what marketing was. And um, I didn't think startups had the luxury of doing anything that was not directly measurable on its impact on growth. And, um, and so it was very much of a startup thing when I when I first came up with the term and um, but at, you know, I think like with with any and, and for me by, by calling it something different then I could define it exactly as I wanted it to be and so there, there was a lot of people that were it was probably it was, it was when I was at Dropbox and looking for that replacement for myself that um, a lot of the people were saying you know here's my skill set and it was it was like a regurgitation of a, of a marketing textbook <coughs> and me just looking at that just saying that you know, Dropbox does not have the luxury to do those things. We gotta, we gotta do a subset of, of like one tenth of that that has a direct impact on growth. And and by re by calling it something else, I could I could more clearly define what it was. I never expected it to take off as it, as it did, but it. Uh, I think, you know, I, I think that as I what I defined more closely represented how, how Facebook was approaching growth, how LinkedIn was approaching growth, how, how some of these companies that had growth teams were approaching growth. And that, I had that in mind as I looked at it. Um, but uh, now today, to me, growth hacking has evolved to where it's really a process. And, um, and it's, it's a process where marketers traditionally just have access to acquisition. Some, some of us got a little bit of access to activation and some of the conversion stuff, but even that logged me in. I, and I, one of my first hires was a was a front end engineer to do um, conversion rate optimization. But our engineers said, "Well, you're on the marketing team, so we're going to create a 
landing page environment where you're blocked from everything except for these like little subdomain of landing pages, and and so there's this kind of fear and permission that marketing doesn't have access to things where like the best growth teams have have report into the product organization, have access to all of the powerful growth levers all the way down into retention and revenue and referral. And it doesn't mean that acquisition is not an important growth lever, but everything should be weighed across, you know, where today, where is the lowest hanging fruit of the types of experiments that we should be running. So at, at Growth Hackers, the majority of our experiments are around retention right now, but as, as retention, which we carve out that low hanging fruit, then we'll probably shift more to acquisition. So people ask, and people, I'm sure people have asked you, it's marketing, right? And, and and you respond, it's it's marketing. It's what marketing should be, sure. <laughs> but it's also it can be product. It can be yeah. But I think marketing, support, can marketing, be, the one of the four P's of marketing is product. So right. like you know, you can make the argument that that it is what what marketing should be. But by calling it marketing, people's preconceived ideas of what marketing should be doing and where marketing should be operating is is so different than I think the, the truth of where growth best happens that calling it something else open the door to more access. And I, I hear from lots of companies that I have a head of growth because because a head of marketing would not have access to this stuff. So I, I think it's just words. It doesn't really like you know what what it's called matters a lot less than than ultimately ultimately how how do you best drive growth for each business? And I think it's easier to drive growth if it's not called, if this set of functionality is not called um, marketing right now. Hopefully people's minds open up eventually and, and allow a marketer to have access to it. Uh, today it's pretty rare that a marketer has, has deep product access. Yeah. So, so is, it a, is it a title, is it a team, is it a mindset? Is it the way that you organize? I think it's more of a process, yeah, than the way that it, that you organize. It's um, it's it's that systematic experimentation across across the levers of growth, and that um, and that uh, yeah. I, to me, as you do that and as you learn from that, your mindset does change. But I don't think the mindset necessarily necessarily um, drives it initially. I, I, I don't know, but I'm just kind of figuring it out. Like I do think it is interesting that on that slide of the companies that I that I showed um, who really pioneered growth teams, all of them tend to be network effect businesses. Mm -hmm. And I think part of the, part of the thing with the network effect business is that it's really not viable until you have critical mass. And if it's not viable, then it's really hard to raise meaningful money. And so there's a little bit of a chicken and an egg in terms of funding with those businesses. And so if you if you look particularly in the, the early days, they had pretty good traction by the time they raised meaningful amounts of money. But I think at that point then the mindset was already in place. The culture was already in place that they realized that even though it was needed in the early days, it's not necessarily needed now. It's just such a better way than throwing a bunch of money and growth the way that traditionally marketing has done that they that, that it's stuck. Yeah, no, but you bring up a good uh, question. Uh, you know, because you, you said it kind of started out with startups in, in your mind, what growth hacking was, and now you know we see a lot of big companies have teams, and I want to get into that a little more. How you think they're organized and, and, and so on, but um, but yeah, they're all network effect companies. So are there examples of companies of, of larger companies that are not you know network tech companies? Uh, that have that mentality, and what are some examples? Yeah, I mean, I think I think HubSpot, for example. I, I think what you start to see is that um, that compete. You know, part of what's driving this is that channels have gotten really crowded, and you know, that the, there's like four dollars for each person online. You know, being spent on advertising versus you know, for every one dollar that was spent ten years ago, and it becomes harder and harder to buy attention. And so if you can if you can engineer solutions that earn attention, uh, that that tends to be more sustainable in some senses. And so like at HubSpot with their website grader product, um, just looking at a B2B example, mm -hmm. HubSpot, um, you know, by, by essentially, if you think like how, how could HubSpot have spent money, I'm a customer of HubSpot, and, and an early shareholder in HubSpot, and I still barely understand what they do. 
Like how, how could they spend money to drive demand for HubSpot? Like it's, it's pretty hard when, you, when you're kind of defining a category that's kind of confusing, but with their website creator product, they could say, you know, run this, run this tool on your website and we'll let you know how effective it is for being found in search engines and, and some, some other things and we'll give you a score back. Like they, they were able to bring it down to something that was impulsive integrate with their sales process to where now a salesperson could be walking them through that report and 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 ultimately it's people are paying to be qualified which is kind of what i did with with that question the the, the how would you feel if you could no longer use this product question as a consultant i i published that survey on survey.io and so when when companies were looking to work with me so i did the interim marketing roles and then i did consulting after that and what I knew is that I, I was not gonna be very successful with companies that weren't there. I was gonna spend a lot of time if they didn't have enough people who considered their product a must have. So by making it a free surveying tool, they could go out, run that question, and essentially do the qualification for me. And then I said, if you're above 40%, bring me, bring me your report. I'll talk about what the next steps are and if it makes sense to work together. Um, so I think it's really similar to kind of what, what, they, what they've done. So that would be an example of like non-network effect business. Yeah. But I think kind of every business sort of has network effects to it as well. Like even as a consultant, I had network effects. So right. they're basically anytime you ask for equity, you know, I mean VCs are basically you've got to pitch that consultant for equity to the VCs who then now introduce you to their other pitches <laughs> to their other portfolio companies. Okay. So it's kind of yeah, that that's that's a longer conversation <laughs> on, on the network effect question is that I think every every business and it's part of why we're moving from Kuala Roo to to growth hackers or, or essentially like long term we'll be investing more in growth hackers is because network effect businesses have, have just a lot more upside and they're harder. But if you can take a non network effect business and leverage it into a network effect, you're, you're likely to create something that's a lot more valuable. So uh, companies like Facebook are known to uh, to sort of, or at least a couple of years ago, have growth teams that would kind of move around from place to place, not really stick in one sort of line of business, and move around from place to place. Um, how do you think that works, that, that sort of model? I, I think it's great. I mean, again, like I think Facebook's the poster child of like who, who's doing growth right. There's, there's a reason why all of these other companies with effective growth teams have some some key early person on the growth team who came out of Facebook. I think that that that, that it's just not it's not a coincidence on that. And so, if you, if you look at it from the benefit of your you run out of ideas over time, like it just like yeah, as you run experiments, you're going to get inspiration for other experiments to run. But at the same time. You know, if you drop fresh into something, you're much more likely to have a bunch of ideas pretty quickly, as, as long as as long as uh, what's been tested has already been like well documented. So you're not just coming up with you know first time you use if you three times suggest ideas for for growth tests and people say we've already done that, then there's not a fourth time. It's just like oh, it doesn't do things. Uh, but if you have an access access to a pretty good knowledge base and then can go in and make suggestions, I. I would think you would want to rotate people through that system pretty quickly so that you get a fresh input of ideas and, and cross pollination of learning like what worked in this business. You know, if I've, I've got the playbook that worked here, I want to see if any of that playbook applies here. And so, you know, ideally, it's not just in people's heads, but it's it's actually transparent so that anyone in business A, business unit A, can get can get access to all experiments that were run in business unit B and vice versa. Yeah, just Opens up um, more more learning, and that's why you know one of the first one of our VCs is Index Ventures out of, out of London. And one of the first things that they did when they saw our plans for campus was that they want to create a network of each of their portfolio companies because they they already try not to invest in competitive companies, and so being able to create a confederacy of mm -hmm. people having access to their experiments just it just makes a lot of sense. I want to open it up now um, to the to the audience here. I'll give you guys a chance to ask uh, Sean uh, a question. Uh, Jonathan. Hey, uh, Sean, thanks for sharing today. It was really, really insightful. And um, 
So I actually saw the Survey.io thing for a new product we were developing at um, the growth team here. We actually um, did did a version of your must-have question as sort of like an exit survey to a test. And um, the thing that we were looking at was um, really trying to understand when to ask the must-have question and, and why like why a certain moment was the best time to ask it. And I was wondering if you had any thoughts on that. Yeah, so what I, what I tend to do is um, I, I, I like to ask it for people who've at least experienced kind of the core experience of a product. Like, you know, somebody who's signed up and never used it, yeah. you pretty much know the answer. Like, they're not gonna care if they can't not use it anymore. Um, so they want, I, I want people who've used it at least twice. At least and, twice. and so if they've used it twice and, and at least in the last two weeks. So it's, you've got kind of that recency of usage and, um, and actually, you know, actually given the product a good, a good you know, if it's, if it's not a must have, just because they tried everything doesn't mean that they're guaranteed to uh, consider it a must have. There's lots of choices out there. Um, so those, those are the, the big criteria on it. One thing that's kind of interesting with, with that question, um, I, one of the companies that I worked with that's now a couple billion dollar company, when I first asked that question, they were just at 70%. And wow. I was like, oh crap, I just committed to six months with these guys and they're at 7%. Uh, and I just come off of a couple of companies that are doing really well today that were like 50 and 70%. And like, so I'm looking at 70%. And, uh, but we got that company to 40% in two weeks. Wow. And the way that we did that was uh, we, basically studied the answers and then the 7% were all using it in a very similar way. And um, most of the other people were not using it in that way. So we, we repositioned around the benefits that they were getting, took a lot of the noise out of features that didn't relate to that and just streamlined, streamlined kind of the, the positioning and the onboarding to take them into that experience. And so that next cohort of users was at 40% and then by the time I left it was at 60%. Um, I have a question about, have you worked with businesses that have commodity products for which the growth hacking works and how does it work? Um, so I haven't and I think, you know, I think that question is essentially, is essentially the opposite of the commodity product question because what I found is that people who think somewhat disappointed all say, well, I would just use product X instead. Okay. And so, you know, that I think that I think there's a book called Differentiated Die. Like, like to me, that's the you know, being able to find being able to find what is that what is that unique must-have attribute of a product um, is is uh, long-term. I think what's what's critical. Uh, you said that um, um, increasing test will like help companies grow, but is there any limit for that? Like. Is it just that like the more tests you have, like the faster you can really grow, or like, is there any limit for that? Well, I think there's there's a limit in the sense of you you don't want to run tests on top of each other. So there's there's certain like just just constraint limits, like uh, you know with, with Yahoo you probably have enough traffic to where you know, for for like activation tests you can probably you know, but even if you have a representative sample size, say in in two hours running somewhere, there is like a time factor where you know, maybe it works, maybe it's the winter on Tuesdays, but not every other day of the week, so you wanna run it over a seven day period, for example. So I think there's some kind of natural constraints about just how many how many tests that you, you can run lots of channel tests. I don't think there's a limit, but, but you know, optimization tests at, at specific points in the conversion funnel, you, you can constrain there. But to me, it's really about how do you, how do you up the tempo of your testing and stay very systematic about it? How do you, as soon as it becomes haphazard, you're no longer you're no longer testing to learn and to get signal. You're, you're confusing signal to where it just kind of gets gets out of control. So that's where, you know, for us, um, one of the first uh, constraints that we had when we started going on a um, on, on a more of a sort of assembly line of, of, of growth, you know, where there's New tests being started, active tests, tests that are being completed, was that we saw um, we saw our queue of tests to be analyzed explode. 
Like we just, that, that was our big bottleneck. And so that told me I need to go out and hire another analyst quickly uh, because if I didn't do that, then it meant that we were gonna have people shortcutting the analysis and not doing a very good job on the analysis just to, just to stay on tempo. And, and if you're not running good analysis, then, then again, it's, just sort of haphazard testing. So I think that's what, what I would do is, is set an ag aggressive but achievable goal and then and then ratchet it up like literally one one more each month and try to run the most impactful tests within that goal as, as possible. Which what's great is that even with, with three, like some of our highest impact tests, we have a test that increased email collection by 700% in a month and it is a test that took like 30 minutes to implement. You know, it's basically just moving an email collected from the bottom of the page to the top of the page. And then we doubled it again, we moved it back down to the bottom, but it was a redesigned, sticky design that stayed when people scrolled and, and looked a lot better. So, uh, I, and then even that was a relatively, that probably took longer because we needed a designer to come in. We did, we, there's a little bit more technology around, not technology, but just, you know, a little bit more coding around uh, making it sticky, but it was a double down test. So we already, we had signal that messing with the email collector was going to, um, it, you know, it was yielding results. So it was worth the investment of a little more time to, to, to try to get it to the next level and got us another 30% increase. Yeah. You showed a couple screenshots of some software. One was a list of ideas and their ice score, and the other was uh, like a gamification thing where you're showing, what's, that, does that software you guys make? That, that's the Canvas product. And that's part of Qualaroo or part of Growth That's part of Growth Hackers. Okay. That's, that's the part that, that's in, in private beta right now. Okay. Right. And yeah, that's with the, the big list of people that want to. Yeah. Okay. yeah. That's too bad. Um. <laughs> you guys are, are welcome to use it. In fact, I think we got a couple different teams from Yahoo that are on, on the list. Jason's already talked to one of them. Yeah, mm -hmm. just come by right after we wrap up. I'll Okay, cool. Uh, what is your what is your process there? So, or the process you recommend that people use for that? So, is it you know you know everyone every employee in the company can submit an idea, and then how do the you know how do you generate those ice scores? Yeah. So the way that we do it right now um, is we, whoever creates the idea actually puts their own ice scores on there, which is probably a bit subjective, right? Totally <laughs> subjective, but you know versus versus. Like, but we still, then we go through a nomination process mm -hmm. and um, for every three ideas that we pick, there's like 15 that are nominated and we narrow it down to those three and during that nomination process, we'll look, that's not a 10 on ease, that's like a right. two on ease. And we'll yeah, and right, so, yeah, the concern would be that people would be bummed out if they felt like their ideas were being ignored. Yeah, it was just but I think the that. reality is that their ideas are already being ignored. They just don't have any sure. person. They don't have any understanding why. Yeah. Like the transparency of, well, the impact score, if this works, it's not gonna be really impactful and it's a really expensive test to run. Yeah. Like that, I think they're more likely to, at least, at least they understand what changed. Yeah. yeah, cool. But versus, like, I can tell you back in my block me in days, I've matured a little bit, but <laughs> I uh, remember just like, felt like any ideas that were coming out of the sales team was, was criticisms and second guessing on my team and myself and it was just like yeah. guys stick to sales we're doing marketing stay out of our hair like where today at least I would I, I encourage and our marketing team encourages our sales team on Paul Root to, to submit ideas thanks for coming in today um, yeah. one of the choke points for experimentation uh, as well as looking at analytics are the tools behind them and the framework <laughs> behind them given the landscape of companies that you work with are there ones that stand out, especially for larger companies, that you actually find using um, versus building in-house for either experimentation and or analytics? Yeah, I mean, that the, um, it's, it's, interesting. it's all over the board. The bigger companies tend not to be using something like Optimizely, but you know, something like Optimizely sure makes it easy to run, run tests pretty quickly. Um, it, from, a, from an experiment management perspective, the bigger companies tend to be using spreadsheets to manage manage the experiments. Um, the actual implementation of experiments, there's, there's something that's online that's pretty, uh, Pinterest hosted something a couple months ago that had 
um, people from the Pinterest growth team, the Facebook growth team, and the Dropbox growth team, and they talked about some of the internal tools that they've built to manage their testing. Um, and uh, I'm happy to send you a link to that if you want to see that, that video. But that, you, what you can see is that these, these guys basically have baked a lot of their own products for doing it. And I think the bigger the organization, the higher traffic that's coming through, the more likely that that's going to be what, what people are doing. But I think that, that the reason that we, like, we would never be able to run experiments at the velocity that we're running them at if we didn't have something like Optimize and like the, the internal And I guess following up on that same question, is there anything, any patterns that you're observing with terms of how people are doing uh, growth hacking tests on native app development with Mira and Mobile? I have been trying to observe some patterns there because um, so I, we definitely see people that are doing it. I know that there are there are products like like Optimizely has has mobile app okay. optimization. Um, the uh, I'm I'm still digging on that one, but I definitely find companies that are running multiple tests per week on, on apps. But I just I don't I haven't figured out a definition of it yet. Jason, do you have any insight on that? Um, no, that. Every time I see a map, a, an app company who's, who claims to be running multiple tests per week, I'm asking, how are you doing that? Mm -hmm. It often comes down to that they're not. So. <laughs> <laughs> I have a question with velocity. So we're, we've are we been talking about you know, increasing the number of tests that's being put out and being run, but how about closing them, right? Because some tests take longer than others, mm -hmm. and I imagine that there's an overlap uh, between certain times because you, know, you, you need time to build a statistic. I was wondering, you know, how, how do you guys manage that? Yeah, so it's, it's we talk about our target of three per week um, tests. We're talking about three test launches per week. We have some tests that have been running for three months. Uh, but, uh, but I know we, our, our to be analyzed queue of tests that have been stopped is way bigger than our active test queue. So if that's any indication, you know, still, even though we, we hired that analyst, we still have a pretty big, big backlog there. But uh, yeah, I mean, I think the biggest thing is you just want to be careful not to, not to run tests on top of each other in the same part of the funnel. Um, but uh, yeah, I, 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 before we had Canvas sort of managing our workflow that at least showed us what's in the active column, we um, we would forget about tests that were running and optimizing. So like, I mean, at least at least now having them recorded in a central place is pretty helpful for us but uh, and then um, on, on the gamification part of the whole you know having like a leaderboard type thing um, how has that helped with idea generation right like has it really helped or you know, what kind of difference have you seen by implementing that kind of system um, I don't know because we didn't really have a control group where we didn't implement it um, but like I said we have, we have we have a relatively small team and we have over 400 ideas in the backlog and we add ideas at more than twice the rate that we can test them. So we have a constantly growing backlog. Um, and uh, you know, part of it is part of it is kind of like you know, what I'm doing when I see someone submit their first idea, whether it's a, an advisor or someone in the company, I'll actually reach out directly and say, awesome to see you participate in growth. Um, when we have a, a change in our leaderboard, like our, we're about that, the analyst that's about to jump into first place is one one idea behind being in first place when I looked yesterday, and I know he'll get there probably in the next day or two, and uh, I'll put that in Slack, you know, the screenshot of the leaderboard and say, oh, we got a new leader, and I know it'll piss off the other guy, and um, so like, I, I mean, the gamification works. It's uh, I don't know that it works well for everybody and in the same way, but I, I think it. It does, it makes it fun. <laughs> yeah. Um, <clears throat> so like, I, I think maybe a problem that we have at Yahoo is that when we come up with a, a new product, we basically have this huge fire hose of people that are gonna come use it. And you had talked a bunch about like trying to stay small sort of until you get the right product fit and then you move to a growth portion. So how do you think we should try to like mitigate those factors or like, <clears throat> Is there something you've seen work elsewhere that we could actually try to use? Like yeah. if we launch something big today and we're really worried about growth, 
Like right now, everybody in the whole fucking world can go see it. Yeah, I mean that's where I would take. I would. I would. I would. I think that's why uh, Steve Blank. If you're familiar with Steve Blank, uh, Four Steps to the Epiphany. You know, he talks about it's his his approach is for startups and for existing companies launching new products. That that basically you know this whole lean startup like being very qualitative. I, I think it's too easy to be super quantitative when you have a whole bunch of users, but being very qualitative around your hypothesis on why people need this, you know, who you think needs it, like documenting all of those things, having those conversations up front, getting as much of that validation as you can going into it, and then, you know, again, like, like for us, I could fire hose a whole bunch of people on Canvas right now, but I learned pretty quickly that people who run one test per month are gonna churn out the Canvas. So part of the reason why I'm not inviting that waiting list in is because until I have functionality that helps people accelerate their tempo, they don't need a system to manage one test per, per month. They're, they're fine with spreadsheets, but as soon as I found people with spreadsheets that were running multiple tests per week, like they're just, like it's, it's bringing water in the desert to someone. So part, part of it is when you can control, like I, why would I invite my whole waiting list only to see them churn now? Like I, it's, it's much better to, and, and then part of what we're doing too is we're looking at uh, weekly cohorts. So what we're saying is if we invite 10 companies in this week, six weeks later, how many of them are still active? And we're looking at you know, daily active users six weeks later. And, and then trying to dig into why are they still active and why are they not active? We're more focused on the why are they still active, but you know, if I want to find out from the other guys, did they, did they go to a different product or did they not have process in place to sustain it? And most of the time what we're finding is, oh, we got this product launch that totally threw our cadence off and we're, we're planning to come back. And so that's not really a problem with my product, it's a, it's a problem with their process. And uh, but I, I, that's where I would just, I would be super, Qualitative. I would err on the side of qualitative when it's easy to be very quantitative. Any other questions? Because I think the main, okay. the main, the main, the main examples when people stop, right? I mean, you show a lot of inflection points, but you know, there's sort of a newness, right? So you can sometimes get this inflection point. And I mean, but I mean, even when you look at Facebook, they always kind of point out, oh, they started this growth hacking team. And successful thing they've obviously grown but it was already starting to go exponential right like there's uh -huh. it's sort of but is it just it just becomes the way to keep that I don't know slope. I think Twitter has stopped recently um, yeah but they have a growth team doing experiments a week they do but from what I've heard is that they're that they slowed their cadence way down on their experiments interesting yeah. well, but I don't know I'm not yeah. inside there but I think I think it's more, more the, the if you kind of the theory behind it of, of basically, if channels get saturated faster now than, than they have in the past, which I which I think is the case, I, I used to be able to work a channel for a couple of years, now I'm lucky if I can work a channel for you know, three months. And so if the channels are dying, you gotta, you gotta discover faster than they're dying just to, just, just to keep some kind of growth trajectory. Back. Yeah, it almost seems like it, it becomes more like maintenance. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're just trying to get the new channel. Yeah, you're, you're at least replacing the dying channels yeah. to maintain, and then and then if you're testing at a fast enough velocity, hopefully you're additive on top of those dying channels. Yeah. But it's uh, but that's where I think just kind of logically it makes sense that that you have to keep doing that testing. But uh, but I do think uh, I do think that it's uh, that there's probably some. I actually somebody said that. Uh, that there's a bias on something that's that, like there's a lot of people that kind of get very very statistical around testing, which makes sense because like you can make errors if you don't pay attention to the statistics on it. But somebody said, well, when you whenever you do something new, you're always going to see a boost, and that was a reason not to not to like turn off the test too quickly. But I heard that and I was like, well, shit, then I just do new, 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 you know, like boost, 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 and, and even if it if it dies off, then I could just at least at least write the boosts. That well, yeah, you see that in App Store releases. Yeah. Release every two weeks with bug fixes as your release notes, just to see an update. Yeah. So, but uh, but yeah, I mean, I but I think like that that sounds what I just said sounds kind of exploitive. 
<laughs> and not sustainable, but I think if you essentially say, basically the only way you're gonna figure out new and better ways to grow is to test a bunch of stuff, and then you wanna be really systematic around how you decide what to test, and if you, or what I can say, that there's, there's a couple of benefits that I see personally in, our, in, in having a, a systematic growth process. One, there's way less dependency on me than I, than I used to feel in other companies where I had to be the idea guy all the time when I can now be more the conductor in an orchestra rather than play every instrument. It's just, it's, it takes a lot of pressure off. And two, the dependency on, on kind of any one person. Pe people, it's a lot easier to then plug in a new person, particularly if you've got a history of what you've tried and like you, you're no longer, you're no longer like a, you've got that one growth hacker who, who if you lose him or her, you're screwed. Like, no, it's really a process that lots of you know, talented people are plugging into various areas and it's them working together that causes the result and not one person. Yeah, also, I do one last thing. Do you ever, have you experimented with testing old ideas that supposedly failed? I mean, just for your point, like channels change so much, so like, oh, SMS would have failed six years ago for yeah. sure, right? But now. Yeah, for fun. sure. I think that's a great. So, one of yeah. the things that we, you know, it, to try to move more of our stuff out of the analysis backlog, one of the things that I've encouraged the team to do is the, the analyst team is that to basically triage it and not not wait till they have perfect analysis of everything because, because that's what's slowing down the process. But when you move something in, into completed and you classify it as a winner or a loser and inconclusive, to have a confident score on your analysis so that when you have more cycles, go back and, and move your sixes to eights and move your eights to tens and and if, if something's a six, then maybe retest it if you if you if you don't have enough confidence in. But we we retest a lot of stuff because we, we feel like the implementation is flawed. So I actually have to do Yeah, that good. This was really great. Thank you so much. Thanks for coming in. Sean, thanks, Jason, thanks for coming in. Everybody appreciate it. Yeah. Okay, well, Jared, I'll follow. I'll make a note to follow up. Thanks. Are you going to go to